Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. Don't mention the neck. On this week's episode, we talk about Mementisaurus. Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards, episode four of series nine. And I don't know what this episode is about at all because Dave has yet to tell me. I'm Izzy Lawrence, by the way, professional broadcaster and children's author and with a mild interest in dinosaurs. And I am friends with Dave, who has, yeah, a very deep fascination with dinosaurs to the point where he's made it his entire career and is very nerdy about it. Hello, Dave. Hello, Dave. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) professional broadcaster recording a podcast that they don't know what it's about that's true but that's the fun um well as i was about to say um it's not quite on the subject i was intending it to be on when i discovered i didn't have the access to the paper i wanted to talk about which has required a relatively rapid emergency uh, rethink of today's subject oh so what are we what are we going to have a have a chat about do we reckon what we are going to do and i'll probably save the other one for next month see if we can get hold of the paper in the next four weeks um is mementisaurus which we've at least muttered about before but there was a a really massive and very cool paper on this two or three weeks ago and I know the authors went for some PR stuff because I got interviewed for a couple of outlets and then I didn't see anything. Oh. It's a very cool paper and it should have got more attention so here's it getting some more attention and we don't do sauropods enough frankly so. So from this I know that uh, Mementosaurus is a sauropod and therefore one of the ones that looks like how did how did somebody described it was it I can't remember which one of your friends described well, a, it a snake that swallowed a pig is a fairly common one yeah or or, 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 a, or a snake threaded through a uh, terrapin though that's particularly good for um, a plesiosaurs as well yes that's true you're welcome a source thank you a source um, Mementosaurus tell me just the basic bare bones obviously bare bones because uh, but... the whole <laughs> professional stand up um, so the, the, the real thing for, for Mementosaurus is is it's got even by sauropod standards an absurdly long neck. So most of the estimates come in and say that Mementisaurus is about half neck. Wow. And when these are animals that have really quite big bodies and very long tails, even if it's relatively short tailed, to end up half neck is unlike pretty much any other sauropod. And how big a sauropod is it? So I know like Europosaurus is tiddly tiny and then Titanosaurus is massive. So where in the scale of You're talking twenty five meters. Okay, big. Not at the absolute giant sizes, and again, not least when there's really quite a lot of neck there, but bigger than Diplodocus, or Diplodocus as you prefer, bigger or at least comparable to a Patasaurus. You know, these are big animals. I thought Dippy would be longer than 25 metres, but maybe I was just small. Well, the long, the longer, so Diplodocus longus, which in theory isn't acting that much longer than Diplodocus carnegii, which is the one everyone knows, it does get to that kind of length. And then you've got Supersaurus, which became Diplodocus and was recognised now as a very large individual as Diplodocus, yeah, it probably gets up to that kind of size. But the kind of Diplodocus Carnegie, the famous Carnegie specimen, which is in London, Milan, Paris, and half a dozen other places. Dippy. Yes, which for those in the UK would know as Dippy is smaller than that. Mementisaurus is one of those animals which has suffered from a whole bunch of classic paleontological problems, and that's partly why this new paper by Andrew Moore and colleagues is really quite neat. So you, you've got two classic issues. So first of all, some of the original and early Mementisaurus material, indeed some of the best stuff, came from a place called Zigong in central China. So there's this famous Zigong Dinosaur Museum, which is in the absolute middle of nowhere. I've been there, and it's like a four-hour bus ride from Chengdu, which isn't particularly well-known. Chengdu is well known because it's where the panda breeding centre is in central China. So everyone goes to Chengdu to see the pandas. What they don't do is then get on, fight their way through the bus station to get a ticket to sit on a bus for four hours to go up to Zigong and visit the dinosaur museum. But... In the Zigong Dinosaur Museum, unsurprisingly, lots of dinosaurs, but it's one of those really quite few and far between museums where a huge amount of the bones are just left on the floor and they basically just built a warehouse around it and called it a museum. Cool. And so there's just a, yeah, in, in Dinosaur National Monument, you've got a wall. Um, here you've got a floor of dinosaur bones in an enormous area. And it's one of the biggest found. And you've got three in particular sauropods coming out there. You've got a uh, thing called Omisaurus, 
and you've got a thing called Shunosaurus, both of which are fairly early sauropods. So this is um, Middle Jurassic in age. So these are quite early sauropods. So these are fairly, I don't want to use the word primitive, but they don't have a lot of the really derived features that we see later on. Both of them, I would say, look kind of like Camarasaurus. They're kind of fairly generic early sauropody. Okay. So not particularly long necks, not particularly long tails, don't have like the high shoulders like Brachiosaurs or anything like this. But they're on four legs rather than two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got true sauropods. Okay. One thing they do have, which has been a perpetual issue, is a tail club. Whoa! So there are a couple of sauropods with tail clubs. And for a long time, the question has been exactly which ones have it. Because, surprise, surprise, the bones in the quarry are mostly disarticulated and separated. So we know there are sauropod tail clubs sitting in the quarry, and there's multiple sauropods there. So which one has it? I think everyone's confident Shunosaurus does, but it's been argued that Omisaurus does, and it's been argued even that uh, Mementisaurus does, based on these tail clubs. So you've got Shunosaurus, Omisaurus, and then you've got Mementisaurus. And there's one particularly nice Mementisaurus skeleton from there, but also a whole bunch of bits. So, first of all, what exact bits actually go in this damn animal among all the bits that are knocking around? Can I just pause and ask you a bit more about this museum before we go on to Mementisaurus' bit? Because when you describe the entire floor, are you just saying that they basically got loads of tables out and the bones put on the tables? Or is this actually like they've uncovered a floor of... So there, there's a... There's a, there's a more traditional dinosaur gallery with mounted skeletons and casts and signs and stuff and then out the back is a room off the top of my head 30 40 meters square i mean i have been there but 50 18 years ago now and you can walk basically around the edge and on on a little mounted like walkway like a treehouse walkway and the ground is more or less as much dinosaur bone as rock wow what was it well a mass burial site i mean presumably some kind of flood or or, or landslide or something like that and there's some fairly famous things there so yang Shuanosaurus, which is this really big theropod is from there gigant spinosaurus which you'll never guess has gigantic spines um <laughs> which is an early and interesting stegosaur is from there the gigant spinosaurus that is a spinosaur no it's a stegosaur what they can't do yeah. that oh i mean G- gigant spinosaurus is is one of the kind of legendarily who the hell did this paint so the original <laughs> anatomical description is i believe in something like like the Chengdu University Journal of Electronic Engineering or something. I'm not kidding. It's I haven't got it exactly right, but it, it's something like that, where clearly this young academic or PhD student got hold of this skeleton, was told to write it up, discovered they don't have a paleontology or biology journal, so just stuck it in the Amazing. most accurately available thing, and it is something like electronic engineering or computer science or something, and there's like this three-page paper in Chinese with no illustrations in a technology journal, and mysteriously, most other scientists missed it <laughs> for a long time. It got a much better description rather later, but it's a fairly complete skeleton and it's really quite an interesting and important animal. Giant parascapular spines. If you remember, stegosaurs have these. Stegosaurus is weird in not having this. The other stegosaurs do have a big pair of spikes that stick out of their shoulders and point backwards. And the ones on gigant spinosaurus are gigantic, hence the name. If, by the way, you're thinking that we're breaking the no stegosaurs rule, our patrons might have had a Christmas present of a stegosaur episode, which I may release to the main feed at some point. We never had a no stegosaur. We had a no stegosaurus rule. Oh, okay. And again, it wasn't, e- wasn't exactly a rule, more <laughs> something that kind of happened. <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, and then you've got a very cool pterosaur. There's a thing called Angostinoripterus, which is just a skull, but it's a magnificently preserved skull in 3D with really big teeth. Like, they stick out of the jaw and they stick above and below the jawline, if that makes sense. So they're that, you know, absolute fangs. Uh, and it's really big. I think it's the biggest, before Jark came along, um, it was by far the biggest Jurassic pterosaur known from even or it's obviously not complete remains when it's a skull but like a good piece rather than like here's a fractured wing element or half a humerus Angostinoripterus 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 gosh yes. yes so yeah all of that stuff is knocking around in Zigong 
And getting back to the, the core story of Mementisaurus, you've got this one really good Mementisaurus skeleton, which has been described. So when I was in Zigong, they've got a little gift shop where you can buy some dinosaur tat and they sell scientific papers. Cool. And there was these three monographs on Yangtranosaurus, Mementisaurus, and I forget what the other one was. I think Omisaurus and Shunosaurus together. And in one of those classic bits of that sounds good until you think about it moments, the uh, director of the museum proudly told us that this was the only place in the world where you could acquire these. And it's like, that that makes you sound prestigious, but you do understand that the concept of science is to share the data and the information and not sending it to anyone else and not letting people buy it unless they physically show up at your museum. It's a very um, Isaac Newton version of science, that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it, 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 you know, or Rutherford. It, it's, it's not ideal. And then it's mostly in Chinese, printed in appalling quality paper. So it's one of those ones where you can read it and like the so there's a big English section at the back so the English description isn't bad at all actually but it's you know three quarters of it is in Chinese and you can see that actually the figures and the photographs are really nice and then have been reproduced badly on really cheap paper so happily there is a good description of most of these things out there but it's still not great that only came out in the late 90s early 2000s they're relatively recent for animals that were found in the, the 50s and 60s and they're incredibly not widely available available at all so that's problem a <laughs> with working out what's going on with in order to discover this dinosaur you have to travel four hours away from their nearest airport by well, bus so, well so actually well that's the uh, pro- problem a is it's mixed up with other stuff problem b is it never really got a really good description and then problem c the inevitable other one is there's a whole bunch of random bits from all over china which have all been named as mementisaurus and all been named as different species of mementisaurus uh. despite the fact that they never get properly compared to the original one which itself hadn't been described properly and ugh and so you've just got this classic horrible taxonomic mess of we're not sure which bits go where we're not even sure what the original quite is and what we should be comparing it to and now there's a whole bunch of random names attached to random things which kind of need sorting out but like the Quetzalcoatl stuff we talked about need sorting out in relation to an original which itself hasn't been sorted out yet yeah which brings us to the new paper which sorts out a fair chunk of a lot of these issues and therefore is really quite cool and quite important. I mean, the first thing to, to, to recognise or, or to talk about, at least, is how long this has been going on because although Andrew Moore, uh, I don't know how long he's been working on the project, but Paul Upchurch, who we've had on the pod before. Love Paul Upchurch. Yes, and Paul Barrett are both co-authors on this paper and they were out in China looking at this stuff while I was working out there 15 years ago. So I know they've been working on it for at least 14 15 years at this point the paper here is based around a species specifically called mementisaurus sinocanadorum so china canada okay which sounds very odd until so we're getting lots of fun history here in the mid 90s so kind of before china had really begun to open up in the way that it has now phil curry and a bunch of colleagues in canada basically were able to organize this basically partnership and so a bunch of canadian people went over to canada and they did a bunch of dinosaur expeditions in the yeah, late 90s and dug up a bunch of stuff cool and there's some extensive reports on these so some really co- cool uh sinon thesaurus uh and some very cool stuff was dug up there's a whole bunch of weird exchanges going on so there's some casts of chinese material in canadian and north american institute which ultimately came from this because of their partnership when i was in china they've got Got, uh, in the IVPP in, in Beijing where this was centred around uh, they've got a cast of the skull of Black Beauty the T-Rex well that came out of the Tyrrell Museum because they own Black Beauty their technicians also mounted a bunch of Chinese stuff so anyone who's ever been to the IVPP and I know at least a couple of our listeners have you'll have seen things like the theropod Sinraptor and Monolophosaurus and the juvenile sauropod Bellusaurus which we'll get onto in a bit and they are all like mounted in a wall like there's a wall of rock and then the skeletons are kind of mounted in in it and i was told this was done by the canadians or at least under their instruction because yeah if you go to the tyrrell museum you'll see that's how they mounted the skeleton of black beauty so there's the whole bunch of interchange going on and on one of these sino-canadian expeditions they found the remains of a new sauropod and thought it was mementisaurus and therefore mementisaurus sino-canadorum to commemorate the cooperation between the teams well canadians are very polite aren't they so i'm not surprised they got the diplomatic rights that's that seems good 
<laughs> yes. Uh, Momentisaurus cynocanadorum, which isn't known from very much material, but that material is really famous. So there's a chunk of palate. There's a left lower jaw, so the mandible, uh, which is in really good nick. All the teeth are there, and it's basically complete and articulated. Uh, it's got this really kind of big chin at the front. Uh, so they do have uh, rather brachiosaur-like skulls in having a big kind of domed, thin bulge to the top of the head. And then the lower jaw is quite thick. And then, yeah, at the front, the chin kind of juts down, which you actually see on a bunch of sauropods. So there's a bit of jaw strengthening going on. And then they've got relatively few big teeth. So that's what's in the jaw. So that's quite nice. And then there's bits of three vertebrae. So the um, axis, which is the second bone. So you have these specialized bones at the base of your neck called the atlas and then the axis. So now we need to do some history. So what did atlas hold up? The, what? the sky. Heavens. Yes. Oh, you nearly I did nearly it. I nearly yes. did it. I nearly did it. The classic track. Atlas does not hold up the world. <laughs> atlas holds up the sky. Um, but anatomically, atlas holds up the head. Okay. So the first, the first bone is in the neck is called the atlas. And then you have the axis. Uh, which helps things move. And then you have three, four, five, six, seven are the kind of normal ones, but traditionally they're called atlas axis two, three atlas axis three four five six seven so you've got the uh, axis you've got three so the first kind of inverted commas normal cervical vertebra and then a chunk of four but four's really squished so three is really momentisaurus like it's pretty long it's like 30 ish centimeters wow. long which is you know quite big for the this, remember this is right at the front of the neck this is the smallest one it's in like the neck um, twice the length of my neck isn't it that's yeah, yeah. So, so it's like so it's 30 odd centimeters long it's about 15 high i think it's about 10 12 wide it's rather squished. Um, some nice CT work, which appears in this paper, shows that it's very pneumatic, more than you'd expect, even for a sauropod neck, certainly for a middle Jurassic one. So they've really cut the bone down. Yeah, are they, that, that surprises um, because, you know, obviously we know how pneumatic they are and how delicate they are. And so I didn't think that they could be more pneumatic. Yeah, you can, you can get away with some in places. Okay. Um, and then the bit they're really famous for is the cervical ribs. So dinosaurs have ribs attached to the cervical vertebrae neck ribs yeah that that's nearly two and a half meters long what hang on hang on okay so hang on this is a this basically their rib cage goes up into their neck yeah so as usual mammals are weird and what people think of as being normal because it's normal in humans or normal in mammals isn't normal in most animals all right mr tortoise well it's true but right mo- <laughs> you know most animals the neck and all of the all of the body have ribs whereas we don't have them on the neck and indeed our torso you know you have your ribs that you you know your your vertebrae on the bottom don't have ribs you know you've got a very squishy tummy with with no ribs on it i've been going to the gym actually i'm talking about myself <laughs> <laughs> you in a more general sense rather than you individually Squidges um kids. so this is not but yeah th- so there's this literally i think it's 2.3 or 2.4 meters long they've got a guinness world record certificate sitting in the museum for this i think they got it as longest bone in the world but having spoken to a couple of people there are probably whale jaws which are longer but it's certainly the largest dinosaur bone etc etc and yeah it, it's a rod i mean I mean, it's the thickness of a pencil for most of its length right and how would it uh, explain to me which way so this would because i'm thinking pointing of a backwards rib, pointing yeah. backwards uh, up out of their skin so so just, no no so th- think of it as basically yeah a, an incredibly long strand of spaghetti yeah and and near the near the front end it basically has a little bit poking up so it's it's um a, a lowercase a lowercase t shape with oh a, hang on i'm confused with no now. like curly end so so say i'm Thing, trying to think of it as like my my neck okay so there's a vertebrae in my neck which way is the rib pointing is it pointing backwards towards the body towards down, d- so it's a long... threading back down along the spine as so it's structural support for the neck itself yes exactly okay that's and good and if you think so that I each it was of the, su- the skin and the rib- no 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 but if you think of each of the successive vertebrae as having something very similar they sort of then suddenly interlock. you've got a then you, well no but sitting on top of each other okay but you've got that spaghetti thing one strand of spaghetti is slightly bendy but mostly rigid but if you put 20 of them together suddenly you've got quite a bundle of stuff which bound up is probably quite strong and flexible as well a bit more than normal potentially so what we think is probably going on with these cervical ribs is the front bit at least is kind of true cervical rib and then this enormous rod though it's utterly continuous is an ossified tendon i think we've mentioned these before so tendons when they're under heavy load can basically turn to bone basically turn to bone and we think this is what's going on um and that's been suggested for a number of sauropods and with with particularly long ribs 
and it would make sense that they would have massive tendons attached to these to to root the musculature and and basically just try and hold the bones and the skeleton together. Mementisaurus, perhaps because of its really very long neck, has gone overboard on this, and so has particularly ossified or a tendency to ossify its tendons more so than most. But that's all we've got for this thing. But it's got this really you know nice bit of mandible, one very nice vertebra, and this absolutely absurd rod of bone. <laughs> Name a species. It'll be easy. It'll be fine. Well, well, right. And then this is the thing, like, is Cynocanodorum a valid species? If it is, is it even Mementisaurus? What is Mementisaurus? Is actually not a bad question. What is Mementisauridae? Because there's this bigger group of sauropods called Mementisauridae. Mostly all the Mementisaurus species. There's like seven or eight at one point, And then some other associated stuff. All from the middle Jurassic of China. So again, have we got a little kind of local radiation where for whatever reason Mementisaurus appeared, turned into a bunch of species, didn't last very long, didn't get very far, for some reason just lived in China and then keeled over, or have we inevitably screwed everything up because we don't quite understand what's going on? The Middle Jurassic is horribly underrepresented. It's the bit of the Mesozoic that we pretty much know the least about. We've got the fewest specimens, so it's perfectly possible that these things got around further and we just haven't found them. And yes, in general, what is actually going on with all of this? And it turns out, unsurprisingly, that if you actually do a really proper detailed analysis with as much information as possible, you start getting some patterns that look a bit more convincing or look a bit more reasonable. I should say this isn't just the work of this new paper. They reference a whole bunch of, you know, a whole slew of research over the last few years where many people have suggested versions of or something close to the conclusions that they have come to, but this They've is obviously the most the recent one. That's, that's, get that's it what, done. Well, right. But, well, no, but, you know, people, other people have had analyses where they've gone, well, I've analysed this as far as possible and I think this is what's going on, but I don't have access to those fossils and I can't deal with this problem and yada yada yada. So, first of all, we do have a Mementisauridae, so we still have a clade of Mementisaurus and its kin. Those include Omisaurus, so Omisaurus is within Mementisauridae. It doesn't look quite like Mementisaurus, it's an, it's an early version of it. Shunosaurus, is that a... Shunosaurus sits outside of this group, which actually pushes okay. Shunosaurus and Omisaurus further apart than I thought they were, um, but not very far, so it's a, a couple of, basically, branches down. So these are pretty close relatives in the grand scheme of things but Omisaurus is making it into Mementisauridae. Second thing is Mementisaurus as a genus is not monophyletic i.e. there are a bunch of other taxa dumped in there so we've got other species which we have named or other genera that we have named as being we're genuinely sure these are distinctive and then when you look at like the little family tree there's Mementisaurus over here paired with one genus and then a Mementisaurus over there paired with another genus and then a couple more in the middle. In other words unsurprisingly a whole bunch of those random bits that people have randomly called Mementisaurus just because they had really long necks. They're Mementisaurids, they should be in that group, but they're not Mementisaurus proper. In other words, they probably need new names. Okay. One of which is Mementisaurus cynocanadorum. So they do not rename the animal in this thing. They do provide a new diagnosis. So they do say we're very sure that it is distinct from the other things. It should be recognised as a separate thing. We shouldn't be folding it into one of the other the Mementisaurus species, but it probably isn't Mementisaurus in the sense that it should probably have a new genus name, but we're still hampered by a lack of resolution on the original animal, because you really want to work out exactly where that goes and who goes with it. But that alone is quite an improvement, because yeah, I, I know a number of people had seen Mementisaurus cynocanodorum and went, oh well, you can't really tell that apart from other Mementisaurus. It shouldn't even have been named as a species, and now actually that looks really very solid. That's legit. Yeah, basically. So Omisaurus is an Amentisaur. I've got to say Cynocanodorum is also an Amentisaur, but we still need more info on yeah, it's a, it's, it is an, it is itself. a Amentisaur. It is a close yeah. relative of Amentisaur us, but it should probably not be sitting in that exact genus, and it should probably have a new okay. name. So it came out in the analysis closest to I think I think I think a thing called Clamellisaurus. Clamellisaur. Yeah, K L A M E L I. I think I think you spell that. Uh, oh no, it comes out with a thing called Xinjiang Titan uh, and Clamellisaurus. There we go. 
Uh, so that's quite interesting. You've also got a thing called uh, Wan We're oh, sorry, Wham W A M Wham Wham We're Accordia. Wham We're Accordia. Hang on, hang on. It's 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 what what's his face did when he was at the Coca Cabana. Wham We're Recording a uh, song. Okay, I'll Andrew go Andrew Ridgely, yeah. Um, <laughs> so Wham We're Accordia. So Wham We're Accordia is a sauropod, unsurprisingly, but it's a sauropod from Tanzania. So the famous tender guru beds in the late. Jurassic, uh, so Brachiosaurus as was, so now Giraffa Titan, Dicreosaurus, and some other cool stuff. When we're recording, is out from over there. So that is showing, and that comes out as a Momentisaurid. It's within this Momentisaurid day. Okay, so they've got around. So right, so that right, so immediately they're no longer just limited to China, and they're no longer just limited to the Middle Jurassic. Again, that had been suggested before, but again, a bigger, more comprehensive analysis dealing with various problems, pulling that out is really quite neat. The thing that they recover as closest to Mementosaurus day, so not in it, but its nearest relative, is a little thing called Cetiosauriscus, which we mentioned, well, we talked about when we had Paul Upchurch on, because Paul and I were, were chatting about it. Cetiosauriscus is British, so there we have, again, not within Mementosaurus day, but, again, you, you, as you just said, oh, they're getting around, well, yes, because if their nearest relative is British, and then they're mostly Asian, and they've got relatives in Central Africa, or East Africa, that sound like humans to me. Well, right, but but yeah, they're, they're absolutely getting around, and they're rather more diverse in terms of including some of these earlier taxa, and they're certainly getting further out, and you know, more time, more space. They're not this little endemic cluster of things in kind of north and central China. And so, what does that tell us about them as a taxa? Uh, what would you call them? A uh, clade. It's not a species. You a mean clade. You a day? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that would suggest that they're quite adaptable to different environments or are these environments all very similar and they've just um, pocketed ooh, them, that i couldn't tell you because i just don't know but i think it does give them a bit more spread well i mean obviously it gives them more spread but it's that you know it, it's not unusual for little groups to pop up somewhere evolve diversify a bit they're only really good in that space or at that time and then they fall away again and they never actually get very far Look at you, platypus. Oh, that's harsh. <laughs> and most of the people are upset. But, but, you know, but that sort of thing. And therefore, that was certainly a reasonable hypothesis for the Mementosaurus. But of course, now we now know that that's basically not true. They did last longer. They did get further out. They are in other places. Um, so it's telling us that they're not this little Chinese radiation, but they're something perhaps potentially rather more important. And if we had better Middle Jurassic deposits around, and now we've got a bit better understanding of what we should be looking for, we might be able to turn up a few more and get a bit better uh, understanding of, of what they're really doing. There's lots of Jurassic stuff in the UK, isn't there? A fair a bit, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on Cetus auriscus being the cl- the actual closest thing to a Mentisaur. Yeah, it's just the thing we found that we we've got. Um, so that's the first thing. And, you know, a lot of that is really quite neat, quite interesting. The other thing that they've done. So I mentioned Bellusaurus. Bellusaurus is an absolutely tiny sauropod. It's Europosaurus sized. In other words, it's my height. You know, it's a really absolutely tiny sauropod known from <laughs> really <laughs> quite a nice skeleton. Um, and there's another thing called uh, Dana. I think D A N um, from pretty much the same place. These are all from these. You know, a lot of these are from very similar areas. So, Mementisaurus stuff is found across China. So, Chengdu is kind of in the centre. Sinocanadorum is from Xinjiang in the very far northwest, over towards um, Tibet and Nepal uh, area. But we're still talking, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a pretty small region. Uh, I can't remember where either of those two come from. I think Bellusaurus comes from the same area as Sinocanadorum, but I can't remember, and it's not important. However, both of these people have long looked at them and gone, they're probably juveniles. They've got a whole bunch of juvenile features. These are probably juvenile sauropods, rather than just being really small. However, the question then becomes, well, what are they? Because, of course, as we've discussed before, things can change quite dramatically when they grow, in terms of things like proportions. If you haven't got an adult to compare it to you don't necessarily know what it's growing into that's your next problem and on top of that juveniles often lack loads of 
features that would turn up in adults. Might take a long time for tendons to ossify. Well, for one, but but also there's this phenomenon where if you we we know that if you do an you know obviously morphological analysis, if you do analyses of data sets of juvenile animals, they tend to come out kind of inverted commas further down the evolutionary tree than they should actually appear. In other words, well, because juveniles of things all tend to look the same. Well, fetuses do. Well, right. And and so we, we, it's that general pattern, but obviously continued. So yes, a fetal sauropod will look an awful lot like a fetal theropod for quite a while. Even before they've hatched, it'll be very obvious they're different. But that same thing tends to happen in that a lot of the characters that really make you distinctive and being good at the things that you're doing or being that adult animal can appear relatively late. So if you code things that are known, we've got stuff where we know they're juveniles and we'll put them in an analysis and they won't pop out next to the adult. They'll pop out further down the tree and look closer to a more ancient lineage because that ancient lineage hadn't evolved these unique features yet and the juvenile hasn't developed those features yet and therefore it pulls them down. So we can run analyses of things like Bellusaurus and we go, oh, it's a really early sauropod. Well, we kind of knew that because it already looked like like a really early sauropod and it's from a time and place full of early sauropods the question is what sort of early sauropod is it really but in this new analysis what they've done is basically tried to filter out characters that they know are messing around because they change dramatically during growth and if you do that these things lo and behold pop out as mementisaurids oh, that's quite cool they're not like early because i always think of like juveniles having really big eyes and big feet so you know you would think that are oh, these are early sauropods who like were nocturnal and lived in a swamp right that's why <laughs> i mean so i don't know how complete i've I've seen the mounted skeleton of bellusaurus there's an old photo of my blog somewhere i'll dig out i don't think it's very complete but certainly the neck is reconstructed as being the same length as the body in other words really quite piddly um and you might well expect that an early slash slash young momentisaurid didn't have an absolutely giant neck because it just doesn't have that size it doesn't have that reach and that necks probably grow pretty fast during growth so I, i'm speculating a bit here because i honestly can't remember how much neck bellusaurus has but i think it's suggesting at least that that neck's growing quite fast as they grow suggesting niche separation which again is something we know basically must have happened because there's no way that a two meter high bellusaurus inverted commas is eating the same thing that's like an eight <laughs> nine meter high <laughs> reaching mementisaurus it's just not eating the same plant it can't okay and it can't digest them the same way uh, again this is something that has been suggested before the idea that bellusaurus and dinosaurs are juvenile mementisaurus is not new this is a much more coherent and convincing analysis pushing that hypothesis okay so we think that no I'm sorry for bellusaurus because it's a nice it's a nice name it was done, i think, I think it is literally like pretty 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 lizard pretty reptile because it is a lovely little skeleton but yeah that's really very neat and of course if you can confirm that that opens up some really nice possibilities to look at the growth trajectory of sauropods juvenile our sauropods are vanishingly rare having one from the middle jurassic is really quite early in their evolutionary history of a group we're now understanding a bit better there's some really nice potential in that going forward for sure that's cool i'm just trying to think of giraffe next now and how do they grow in proportion or do they get they do grow a bit faster but they have positive allometry so they grow faster than the rest of the body but they're Uh nothing like the rate of positive allometry that we see for sexually selected structures for example okay um so yeah positive allometry is a thing outside of sexual selection so giraffe tend to have very long legs so if you look at baby giraffe they have absurdly long uh, legs and the neck is long but not that long because they're not eating they're just drinking milk so their their key importance is can they reach mum but also they need to have long enough legs to run away because hyenas and stuff so they start with absurdly long legs and a relatively short neck and then the legs don't grow that fast and the neck does grow that fast and so they kind of even out and so in adults the neck and leg length are pretty similar in juveniles the legs are rather longer than the neck particularly in newborns okay so but nementosaurus obviously don't aren't being milked as it were no and the then, you know they're, they're they're almost certainly independent juvenile sauropods but again the they're running on different evolutionary pressures you know they're eating different plants they've they've got a different body shape that's going to be allow them to digest things differently that they're they're not feeding in the same way and i know we've talked about sauropods in detail before but 
why in i mean uh, do you think the extra long neck is down to of the new manchester is down to sexual selection and not something environmental i don't think it's sexually selected i mean that was an argument okay. put forward for sauropod necks um and i'm rather unconvinced well indeed i wrote a paper with mike taylor and darren nation matt weddle saying that we were very unconvinced with this argument um so i mean it's not impossible this is again we, i know we talked about this even just a couple of weeks ago to, a couple of weeks ago a couple of episodes ago talking about sexual selection and stuff like this you know, there, there are indicators rather than absolutes a lot of the time, but also you got to remember multifunctionality. Neck length, I don't think, evolved for sexual selection. That doesn't mean longer-necked individuals aren't using them as signals now, evolutionarily, once it had got going, basically. But I don't think there's any particular reason to, to think that that's what's going on in the source uh, or the others. What does, what does link, though, is going back to that earlier point of those elongated cervical ribs and also that increased pneumaticity, as again the paper suggests, these are linked. You know, this reduced amount of bone is linked to the fact that you've got a really proportionally very long neck and therefore obviously you get kind of leverage problems if your neck is really really long you know every bit of weight becomes effectively harder to balance further out and this causes more stress so absolutely maximizing your reduction of mass is fantastic and again that's another reason for things like ossified tendons because of course if you can massively extend that rod back before the muscle kind of kicks in you're pushing it further back from the end of the neck and so all the other muscles now don't need to work as hard to raise that head up and you can probably reduce them in weight and save yourself even more weight. but you're saying that they've got this really large jaw that's obviously got some muscle attachment to it as well so how they attach it how does that jaw operating because normally i think of a jaw you know it, it's got it's obviously coming in from the back of the skull there's a lot of muscles down the neck that keeps the jaw chewing i mean this is why t-rex has got a massive neck a large chunk of the, of the t-rex neck is holding the head up rather than okay. providing muscle for the for the jaw to act actually bite and remember these are simple animals they don't have complex chewing they just have a simple lever jaw up and down but again you know the evolution has trade-offs that might be a relatively heavy head and relatively heavy jaw but if it works it will be kept and if you can invert commas solve that problem somewhere taking else the brain out well right but you know it, it, you know this this is where i think engineers in particular misunderstand evolution because i've had some run-ins with engineers you know engineers are always looking for the best solution and nature doesn't work like that nature works for the solution that works with the tools available and given the compromises and that's not the same thing at all so yes maybe that head is big and heavy and suboptimal but you know you could solve that by making the head lighter or solve that by making the neck lighter and if the evolution ends up with a lighter neck it still works we could talk again about their feeding and that's you know are these do we think doing the goose system so of feeding i don't or? know um again we get into questions of head angles and neck angles and support and reach and diet and we don't really know i was really quite convinced by the kind of goose argument and i know a couple of sauropod people have gone no it's absolutely dreadful um in my defense i know a bunch of good sauropod people and they're at metaphorically each other's throats over some of this stuff which what it really tells you is there isn't a lot of consensus or at worst there's some good evidence on both sides there might might be much stronger evidence on one side but it's not terrible on the other the other thing to remember of course which i'm saying increasingly is my kind of new phrase is always we need to stop thinking about things like dinosaurs as dinosaurs in that sense or in this case sauropods as sauropods and what i mean is you know i get questions or i see articles or i see stuff online and it's like what was the physiology of dinosaurs as if they're a single uniform thing that all do the same thing in the same way at the same time and that's a terrible way of thinking about them because yeah you go like oh well, you know, mammals are warm-blooded. Mammals are homeothermic endotherms. They maintain their body temperature and they're always warm. Well, apart from monotremes and some lemurs and mole rats. And, and, and um, mole rats die if they get too cold, but monotremes die if they get too hot. And then you've got things like bears going into hibernation. And then you've got things like harvest mice, which go into torpor and basically just do hibernation overnight. And then you've got things like goats and camels, which can tolerate a much higher temperature than other things. But apart from these numerous exceptions All in are the same. multiple different clades in multiple different environments, and that's just the ones that we know about because we've studied them, they're all the same. So yeah, did sauropods hold 
their necks up or down probably isn't a good question. Which sauropods were holding their necks up and which down and how much were they doing that is probably a much better question. See also tyrannosaur predation and scavenging, spinosaurus swimming, you know, parental care and all the other stuff. You know, there is no single simple answer to this. I would love to do a kid's book myself called Splashy the Spinosaur, just to wind you up. (laughs) <laughs> You're so kind. But yeah, you know, we, we've got, you know, things like the brachiosaurs, and I think anyone thinks they have low position necks. Those are fundamentally high positioned. Things like the dicryosaurs are short necked and those necks point down and they've got cropping teeth for taking, you know, vegetarian and nichosaurus, which is another you know, favourite of yours. Uh, you know, those are well suited to that. We absolutely have upright feeding sauropods and down feeding sauropods. The question is, where's the stuff like Mementisaurus, Diplodocus, Camarasaurus? fitting in the middle would that not make because i'm thinking now that these necks would be much more like um like theropod tails and be really quite stiff because of those spines so in this case wiggly so in the case of mementisaurus yes there's there's the argument that they're really very stiff because they've got these enormous ossified tendons they're really trying to cut the weight down and they're they're turning more or less into a single b so those i can totally buy are operating almost like a rigid crane you know with relatively little flexion Whereas if you and and again very long vertebrae, which means they don't have many Can't articulations wiggle. between them. Whereas you look at something like you know a patasaurus, those vertebrae are massive, but they're relatively short with some nice ball and socket joints. You can imagine that those are rather more flexible. I want to see a sauropod dancer that's wiggling its. <laughs> well, neck. yeah, I think well, it would be amazing. Know, re- really, really, what does all of that mean? And and again, you know, giraffe graze. Giraffe will. They, it's not just drinking. They will put their heads down and eat grass uh, when it's very important when it's a big drought they'll eat quite a lot of grass and even normally it's something like 10% of their diet so even giraffes the arch up long legged upright body super upright inflexible neck spend a decent amount of time with their head down in foliage so we we, you know it's again even things like brachiosaurus the question is what's it mostly doing not what is it what is its one trick and and where do these proportions lie and what might be changing them just just um, clarify so nementrosaurus we're getting it in the late Jurassic when Mid, does it middle stop? Jurassic. Mid, sorry, middle Jurassic. I, I, think, I, think, Jurassic? I think all of the true Mementisaurus, or indeed the inverted commas, Mementisaurus species are middle Jurassic. Okay. Uh, but this, yeah, Wamrecordia uh, is late Jurassic. I don't think any of them make it past the late Jurassic. There's none in the Cretaceous. Presumably, I assume that there was a some sort of event that happened between the Jurassic and the Cretaceous that changed things dramatically. Was there a batter species decline then? So, yeah, so you, you've got this faunal turnover and there's the classic what's called the cretaceous terrestrial revolution with the idea that plants are taking out um not plants uh, angiosperms flowering plants are taking over and becoming much more dominant and much more common and in times of dinosaurs yes we see fall of the sauropods in the northern hemispheres we see the rise of the ceratopsians and the um hadrosaurs in the north we see the rise of the tyrannosaurs and and kind of fading away the carcharodontosaurs they mostly in the middle cretaceous rather than the early cretaceous there's a whole bunch of stuff going on i don't know very much about it to be honest i don't think there's an extinction between the middle jurassic between the Jurassic and Cretaceous but there is definitely a lot of turnover and a lot of things are changing and that probably if you're saying that the flora is changing then the fauna has then everything to else is changing but again what's yeah. promoting the floral change is that climate shift is that to do with continental drift um the sh- you know for anyone listening I'm sure some people are kind of yelling at their pod I'm sure this is well known I don't know it because this is not something I've ever looked into so <laughs> go and read some stuff on the Jurassic Cretaceous transition because it's not my area is there anything else in the news that we could cover very briefly it is what's in the news dave apart from the paper we just talked about what is in the news dave it's the jingle what is in the news dave um about or maybe only a week ago now perhaps even less at the time of recording so only two or three weeks ago at the time of broadcast uh there was a new paper out describing a skull of tarchia so tarchia is a really nice ankylosaur from mongolia uh so armored dinosaur club tail etc yes 
which like Saul. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Which I think um, Tom Holt said he'd seen in like the nineties or something. Uh, and again, the the grind of science is only taking twenty five years for someone to get round and and publish a description of this. But it's got a very obvious mess on one side of its skull, and CT scan shows that it has basically this giant bony growth inside the middle of I think the left side, but it really doesn't matter. Like deep in the sinus cavities, you might remember that ankylosaurs have weird curly nostril passages going through their heads and these weird um air, they, they have like crazy straws for air passages up their <laughs> noses uh, and in one case this has kind of just been turned into this horrible big mass of bone and so you've got something very very nasty has happened to it and the authors propose and what little bit has been in the news is this is a tyrannosaur bite okay uh you've got tarbosaurus in the environment you know t-rex size carnivore it's obviously got a bone crushing bite sooner or later they're going to try and kill just about everything they can come across a small ankylosaur relatively small ankylosaur would be on the menu bit the head put a tooth through it didn't kill it animal wanders off nasty infection turns into a horrible mass of bone but it basically has survived a t-rex attack oh, well tyrannosaur attack all well and plausible to be fair to the authors though to be slightly unfair to them i think they have pushed this or certainly the the illustration because it's one of these papers that has a graphical abstract so you have a little drawing to show what's going on or a figure and the figure shows a tyrannosaur biting in the teeth like going through and mashing the skull and then in the actual abstract of the paper it says this could have been caused by trauma or other meats so could have just been a really nasty nasal infection basically yeah i haven't read the paper in detail but the stuff i've looked at doesn't provide anything particularly convincing to say it was trauma so it's absolutely on the table the thing that's most likely to cause trauma in an animal like that is this kind of injury are those kinds of infections more commonly associated with trauma or not i don't know if you can show that they are that would obviously tip the balance heavily in that in that favor but you know even taking my kind of really conservative approach to stuff like this it's more than plausible yeah you know it's it's absolutely absolutely possible that this happened and it's the sort of thing you'd expect to happen so i can easily buy it i just don't know if it is It'd be really fun if it happened when it was a hatchling and the t-rex that, well sorry the transfer that bit it was only a couple of feet tall then yeah, yeah i mean yes. <laughs> well that's the thing you, you know you know you just don't know with this stuff i mean could it also could it also have been i mean if we're looking at trauma could it have been another ankylosaur and just clubbed to the face well, so there was these papers suggesting, yeah, ankylosaurs are fundamentally have tail clubs because they're fighting each other rather than then Makes sense. their primary for, for anti-predator. And therefore, yes, why they have enormously armoured heads? Because if they stand head to tail, they're smacking each other in the head with a tail club. That is absolutely <laughs> a, a possible source of trauma. I, I, think, life. I think the way you'd avoid that is even the kind of pointier tail clubs are mostly quite big and rounded and so you'd expect an impact over quite a big area and i'd expect that sort of thing to break big chunks of the skull rather than cause a hole in a point you yeah. know it's the difference between hitting something with a sledgehammer and hitting something with a chisel they might both really mess up your day Hurt. but one's going to be in a much tighter point than the other i'm going to say it was a bee sting even though there's probably no bees but shut up. Oh, i think we've got <laughs> i think we've got cretaceous bees this is end oh, cretaceous I mean, yeah, stuff should be should be yeah uh, should be if it's if it's end cretaceous stuff yeah because you've got loads of flowers then yeah yeah as we discussed in our you know uh, but we're talking about the Cretaceous moving to well the Jurassic moving to Cretaceous yeah. oh alright then well I think we've probably done enough speaking about Nementisaurus I'm going to try and remember all of the dinosaurs we've covered it. so we've got Nementisaurus uh, we've got the Sinocanid what was it Nementisaurus Sinocanidorum Sinocanidorum so you've also got you um, go. I think Nementisaurus Constructus is the holotype the original and then Nementisaurus Hauhochenensis is the one that's over at Zigong which has the really good description but of course it's not constructors so you can't compare it back to constructors ah we've got we've got the wav we're recording yep that's that's that was one when, when we're um, recording oh uh, what was it the oh Omi. angus thingy ripterus what was that oh, angus dinoripterus the pterosaur angus dinoripterus is the pterosaur and the gigantic spinosaurus which was a stegosaur which is hilarious we had yangstisaurus yang shwanosaurus you had yang yang shwanosaurus Omisaurus, Shunosaurus, Cetiosaurus. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We've done we, quite a lot. Is the one, the one who was 
it was the only sure is the one that you know it doesn't pay his bills and Shimisaurus has already not paid his bills he's had to sell his shoes so there we go uh that's, Shoe that's knee, not sh- not sue me okay sorry okay i said shoe shunosaurus is what i what i thought it was called and the bellosaurus and the danos dinosaurus yeah dinosaurus dinosaurus cool that's a lot of dinosaur names that i need to learn now let's go away and make a list and it's good it's good Oh, we did mention Shing Shang Titan. Uh, and we also mentioned Paul Barris and Paul Upchurch, but they're not dinosaurs, they're people. Uh, cool. And um, Andrew Ball. There we go. All the, all the things covered. So if you want a little vocab test, just listen to the end of the podcast and see how well you do. Awesome work. Um, so we should... Uh, w- what's, what do we reckon? Are, are we going to moo like a... Like a... <laughs> no, we're not going to moo. We're just going to ra, aren't we? The word we has strong me-involved connotations, which you're I... Going to, you're going to do it. David, it's your podcast and you love it and this is why people like it it's just the rowing at the end so after three until next month one two three thank you for listening to terrible lizards for extra content please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards for questions contact us there or on terrible lizards pod at gmail.com Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast a T-Rex Run, and to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag TerribleLizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy.